Welcome and good evening. You're watching I Beg to Defend. I'm your host, Yusuf Ismail, and this program focuses on interactive debate on socio-economic, political, cultural, and religious issues affecting us as South Africans, and certainly looking at some of the global dominant trends in the international community. Today, we look at the ongoing crime drama and malfeasance at ESCOM. In 2008, ESCOM was still functioning with low electricity costs, a manageable and competent workforce. Come 2009, with the emergence of the Zuma administration and regime, political meddling, state capture, and corruption of the most rampant and worst kind leads to the collapse of arguably one of the best power utilities in Africa, if indeed the world. ESCOM CEO, Pakamisani Hadebe, currently earning a whopping 8 million rands, recently had the gal to suggest we must apologize to South Africans for avoidable challenges. Well, what indeed are these avoidable challenges? Joining us to unpack the ongoing shenanigans at ESCOM in part three of our ongoing discussion, we are joined by energy analyst Ted Blom. Welcome, Ted. It's good to have you on I Beg to Differ. Thank you. Mr. Blom, just to start off with um, the situation that we're basically finding, the public seems to be sick and tired of the ongoing pro problems at ESCOM. It's, it's well known fact that the average South African is struggling to keep their heads above water. Needless to say, um, you know, just a few months back, the NERSA approved electricity tariff increases, um, which obviously sent constant dis discernation and shockwaves throughout the nation. What's your take on that? Okay, so I mean, uh, you correct that the problem started around about 2008 when uh, ESCOM big price increases to pre-fund the power stations that it wanted to build. Uh, it's a world first that uh, somebody tries to pre-fund a, a power station, and it's also completely silly. It should have signaled to ESCOM at the time that what they were doing was not feasible. If they can't, if the banks don't want to lend you money, there's probably a reason for that. And uh, unfortunately, the bombastic management that ESCOM at the time going to take no for an answer, and they convinced NERSA to help them uh, increase tariffs to not just pre-fund uh, ESCOM. And uh, the problem is never ended. Ten years still overfunding them, and the total amount of overfunding is now a trillion. And I think that's the reason why the, the public is inside of the burden. People generally don't seem to know, Ted, that this, this particular utility was in fact a world-class utility. In fact, um, apparently the Financial Times Global Energy Awards in New York in 2001 recognized it for generally providing the lowest cost electricity whilst making superior technical innovations, increasing transmission system. And then subsequently there was an inherent collapse, um, particularly in 2008, that led to the crescendo uh, during the Zuma administration. Would it be that it was effectively the individuals within the utility that led to it breaking down, or was it in fact something that effectively began prior to that particular period, going back to the late 90s? Okay, so essentially, uh, the collapse of ESCO uh, became uh, orchestrated around about 2001 with the ESCO Conversion Act. Uh, prior to 2000, ESCO was a self funded utility run by engineers at the cheapest possible cost, and that's why it was in 2001 from the Financial Times. After the conversion cost, Eskom became a for-profit entity, and in other words, competed for profit in the economy. And given the value chain, the critical part of the, the occupiers in the value chain, Eskom was be, uh, uh, to outmaneuver the rest of the industry and to, and to gorge most of the market profit for itself. I was just quite surprised by the... Uh, CEO, uh, the, the present CEO, Pakamani Hadebe, who effectively tried to provide some sort of justification by suggesting that the 15% tariff increase for the next three years or for the foreseeable future um, is in fact a necessity by virtue of the fact that it's obviously run into challenges that the company or the utility cannot in fact solve. Uh, this was made by him at the hearings um, some time back, two months ago, uh, the NERSA hearings. Um, and he stated that the, the, the South Africans can very well expect a far greater than 15% um, over the forthcoming months and possibly years. Well, that's the It's now on a, on a business model that uh, is so expensive to run that it's unaffordable for South Africa. In fact, uh, the 15% tariff increase, if you, 
if you uh, accumulate it over three years plus the RCA, it actually comes to 70%. So your electricity is going to cost you 70% more in three years' time, and that's unaffordable for any South African entity. Um, just quickly, a forensic report um, that, uh, that, that basically emerged some time back um, into the utility. The findings uh, f focus on some of the issues, like, for example, the, in the Fundu uh, Funduzi Forensic Services Report, um, the issue of acquisition of locomotives at Transnet, the appointment of U.S. consultancy McKinsey and & Company and others to advise Transnet and Eskom Holdings, coal procurement from Taget Exploration Resources Limited, that's a company uh, controlled by the Gupta family, uh, the probe into so-called state capture. Would you submit that simply the, uh, I mean, this is a coal-rich country. We shouldn't have a problem with regards to accessing coal. What was the rationale then behind entering into contracts with companies that were unable to provide coal in the first instance? Okay, so they were all precipitated uh, by the 2001 uh, failure of Majuba Colliery, uh, which then necess necessitated that Eskom buy in coal. Uh, it, it got itself a six year emergency mandate, and uh, that expired in 2007. Uh, but in the inter interim period, Eskom had done nothing to secure long-term coal supply agreements. And the, the, um, the on-take of, of short-term agreements precipitated the start of corruption. And by 2008, the corruption on the short-term coal account was about 8 billion rand a year. Uh, that's climbed now in 2019 uh, to uh, 40 billion rand a year. It just opened up a door, and uh, that door was never shut down. Uh, Several people try to shut it down, but the protagonists of the, of the corruption are, are so strong now that it will take a giant effort to try and close that door to corruption. What was the problem at Madupi and Kusile? Uh, uh, um, the Madupi and Kusile issues are a little bit different insofar as uh, the Madupi power station should never have built, been built in its current configuration. Uh, the coal field that Madupi is located on is a very low value coal field. So you need a more robust technology to handle that uh, poor quality coal. Unfortunately, the uh, egos, the egotists at Eskom uh, took it upon themselves to introduce the highest tech power station on the lowest quality field, which is totally insane. And that we will be burdened with that for the next 60 years. Uh, because the price of uh, feed and material to Madupi is uh, extra it's three times more than what it would have been if they'd uh, used appropriate technology because they have to wash the coal and they discard 70 percent of what they mine uh, is acceptable so uh, that is the problem there with Cassidy, uh the power station was built without a uh, committed uh, coal contract and uh, that's why Cassidy's have got big problems in that they are buying coal from every tom dick and harry or spaza shop if you wish and uh, it's not necessarily suited to the configuration of Kusidi, which is also one of the high-spec uh, power stations in the world. Would you then, would I then be correct in, in, in understanding the position that um, a quarter of ESCOM's total power generation capacity was in fact unavailable because of unplanned maintenance issues? I mean, poor maintenance at power stations which cause the unplanned outages a lack of skills, poor quality coal, broken fans, various mill problems, a decline in efficiency in a general sense. Would they be all contributing factors? Okay, so uh, I rationally understand the problems that ask them. One needs to understand that we've currently got the combination of different streams of inefficiency, corruption, maladministration, and incompetence. Uh, the big uh, first maintenance problem is that in 2010, Eskom took a decision to keep the lights on for the World Cup soccer. And to do that, they cut back on maintenance. In other words, instead of taking a machine offline to do maintenance, they kept it on online, even in a broken state, to generate even a little bit of electricity to, to help uh, overcome the shortage of the World Cup. Now, what's happening in the World Cup was the 500,000 visitors that we anticipated would visit didn't come. But Eskom nevertheless didn't change its maintenance policy or philosophy. By 2014, somebody blew the whistle that Eskom had not done adequate maintenance now for four years and that uh, the situation had become dire. And that's what led to the 2014 blackout, 2014-2015 blackouts. Eskom then started doing a little bit of catch-up maintenance. It said it would do it in two years. I said six. But Eskom didn't have the budget to do the maintenance. So that combination 
Aztec made the SOC 2010 is still prevalent in its, uh, in its operations. And that, together with the poor quality coal, in inept uh, management and corruption, to just just on that point, because the public don't seem to be aware of this, the load shedding that sort of commenced in 2009, what was the rationale for that? I mean, people now generally are coming to the conclusion that that was a fraud um, foisted upon the masses. What was the reason for the load shedding in 2009 when we first had the problems initiated back then, just immediately after the Zuma presidency? Okay, so uh, Baker, the load shedding was actually January uh, 2008, and, and that was a culmination of the first emergency mandate, which I referred to a few moments ago. It started in 2001. It was a six-year ma emergency mandate. It expired in December 2007. Uh, then the protagonist of the corruption wanted it extended for another six years, and that was a standoff between clean management and corrupt management. Uh, the corrupt management wanted the emergency rolled over, for, as I said, for another six years. Um, the clean management uh, said no. That's why they then start the Eskom of coal, and that's why we had the, call, uh, the rolling blackouts in January 2008. Uh, the clean management then moved on, and the corrupt management stayed behind at Eskom. They then uh, proceeded to extend the rollover of the emergency mandate for another six years. If you add six to 2008, you get to 2014. And exactly that same uh, circus played itself over in 2014 with a standoff between clean management and management. And again, the corrupt management won, and that's why the Guptas got into the coal food supply agreement. And uh, that's where we are now. The, um, the state capture report started off in uh, 2015 and uh, sort of stemmed some of the corruption uh, growth uh, it's still there but it just hasn't grown as violently as it had in the preceding years so uh, the, i think the 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 um, combination of the corruption and the emergency mandate is what eventually uh, sank escom well ted i just want you to hold that thought because we're going to zero in onto this corruption and, and and identify some of the key role players that need to be thoroughly exposed but we have to go for a short ad break and we'll be back shortly Welcome back to I Beg to Differ. I'm your host, Yusuf Ismail. And today we are in an interesting conversation with energy analyst Ted Blom um, as we spend our third episode unpacking the ongoing corruption and uh, malfeasance at ESCOM. Uh, Ted, just before we went for the break, you did mention the ongoing corruption. I want to zero in onto that. Funduzzi recommended in its report that, uh, that was obviously sent to the Directorate of Prime, uh, Priority Crime Investigations that criminal probes be instituted against certain officials and board members, but more particularly, the key role players which we want to deal with and their involvement in bringing this utility to total uh, shambles. Brian Molefe, Machele Coco, and Anoj Singh. Okay, can you explain um, more particularly, since Machele Coco has, he, we, we, we requested him to come on this particular program, he's turned us down twice now, uh, but what was the actual role played by these individuals? Okay, so uh, uh, you're talking about uh, period 2014 onwards. Yes. Um, those uh, three uh, players uh, held key positions at ESCOM, and they then to the family, which had tried to approach ESCOM in 2010 unsuccessfully because the ESCOM quality control person, Dr. Mark van Arit, had rejected their call offers based on quality. Uh, Mark van der Richten in 2014-2015 was put on suspension and moved out of the picture and then those three protagonists that you mentioned there uh, had a clear road to uh, engage with the Gupta family and eventually ended up prepaying for coal uh, to the amount of nearly 700 million for coal that was never delivered to Eskom. What, what I find quite odd is that you know, the, 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 the coal was never delivered, that was clearly a breach. Had that been brought to a court Clearly, the contract would have been set aside. What was the rationale behind the constant pain? Because 700 million rands was lost for coal that was never received. I mean, that's clearly treason. No, absolutely. Well, I'm not sure if it's treason, but the fact of the matter is that Eskom has been impoverished. And what, what really perturbs me is that even under the new management, 
They did very little or anything to uh, suspend those uh, illegal coal contracts. And it, it was a, uh, I took it upon myself to uh, put a dossier which I've now submitted to the SIU. And if you go to the court roads, you'll see that the Optimum, um, I'm sorry, the Tegeta Brachtain contract is actually up for hearing and for suspension and cancellation. On behalf of Eskom, because Eskom is just too incompetent to do its own work. Um, I was quite surprised to note that um, Machele Coco, in fact, hired spies to find dirt on colleagues to ensure that they were, in fact, removed from the power utility. Individuals that uh, he targeted, people like Group Capital, Abraham Masango, amongst other officials. Um, and, and Masango then subsequently blew the whistle to the former escort board chairman about the alleged corruption involving Coco. Um, he was presently in the disciplinary process. What's the status of that? Okay. So as far as I know, Mr. Rosando has uh, re resigned from Eskom, uh, and he has a cloud of two over his own head. But uh, the spring and the um, uh, backstab within Eskom, unfortunately, is part of its organization's culture. Uh, when I uh, picked up corruption in 2006 to 2008, when I consulted to the utility, I reported the corruption to the then chief of forensics, and uh, I was told that uh, it's fine that just put the stuff in the file and uh, see what surfaced again. Little did I know that was part of the cover-up. And then when I uh, was invited to attend uh, a conference, an international conference, uh, with the hedge funds and the funders of ESCOM, I suddenly found myself being threatened by ESCOM uh, because uh, they didn't want me to spill the beans on the corruption within ESCOM. And uh, I had a, a, a summons delivered to my house in the middle of the night. Uh, by Eskom's uh, 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 military force. Uh, what you don't realize, and what most people don't realize, is Eskom runs the third largest armed force in the country. That's the South African Defense Force, the Peace Force, and then it's Eskom's uh, security forces. And uh, they are ruling to themselves. Uh, they decide who they want to spy on. They even spied on the unions at Madupi. Uh, they spy on other people. They spy on everybody who threatens the corruption within Eskom. It's just a free for all. It's like the Wild West. Oh, I'm, I'm surprised. You're saying Eskom runs a private security force? Absolutely, because it secures all its uh, power stations and all its properties. It's got 400 odd properties across the country. And then, and then uses these forces as a means for intimidation? Absolutely. Some of those forces are misused and used to intimidate and spy on people and external spies. Because if you look at the affidavit, which, which I've, I've in fact. Um, had access to. Um, basically, according to the affidavit's author, um, basically, this, these spying operations have been going on for months. Um, this is what some of the, the mandate and the quotation, the mandate and practice was, is to degrade, sabotage, ruin careers of senior officials from the Eskom Kusili power station. It was speaking about Abraham Masango, Obrim Zobe, and so on. Uh, the affidavit said that they were, by agreeing to tell on the activities of these people, they were promised money and protection. Uh, it goes on to say, Mandla, being the direct person they engaged with, was then promised a few projects in Tutuka Power Station and Kendall Power Station, amongst others, including where they would have control over private and public sectors. And the author also goes on to state that they were paid through a Capitec account, as well as through services such as FNB's e-wallet, Absa Cash. And I mean, this is like kind of a mafia a mafia regime, if you, if you, if you ask me. Well, absolutely. It's sadly been part of the Eskom culture for years and years now. I certainly picked it up when I was back there in 2006, is that the, one of the biggest games in town was the different divisional executives spying and uh, building dirt up on each other via forensic reports. So Eskom does uh, or conducts about 100 investigations a year between the different divisions, and that's how they blackmail each other and uh, hold each other to, to ransom and get away with uh, their own corruption. So uh, it's a big it's a yeah. Russian roulette as far as uh, corruption is concerned within ESCO. It's been ongoing for, uh, I'm told, since 2001, but I only picked it up in 2006. I'm just curious that, that uh, Coco now seems to have become, I mean, he's, the, he's, he's certainly no longer with ESCOM, but I've seen some of his uh, media interviews that he's had with the NCA, um, I think, on the show Madam Speaker and, and a few others and certainly some of the news reports and articles that he's basically contributed um, and, and he's now seems to be coming out as an apologist I just want you to uh, uh, explore this an, in an article he wrote um, a few days ago on February the 22nd 
Uh, this is what he says. He says, the ESCOM story has been told many times by those who are eager to restructure and bundle. However, the, re the real ESCOM story is narrated beautifully in a book called A Symphony of Power, The ESCOM Story. I'm not so sure if you're familiar with this article, but he is, in fact, attempting to somewhat tracing the inherent problems way back to 1993. Um, through individuals, um, for example, uh, he speaks about the steep decline in ESCOM operational performances which started in 2002 and culminated obviously in 2003, 2004. Uh, but he seems to kind of turn the burden or the, the, the shift of blame from him and certainly his stooges to the situation that basically goes back way back to the heights of apartheid. Okay, so I... I I saw parts of that, uh, that article, uh, Mr. Koko. I, I disagree with some of his recollection of history. But uh, certainly, I mean, uh, the problem is at ESCOM. You see, I wasn't inside ESCOM at that time. I, I was there in the late 80s, and then I was back in 2001 for a month or so doing some tax work, and then full time for two years in 2006. So it seems to me that in the last period, between 2001, when the whole mandate of ESCOM was changed, as well as the management, that's where the corruption seems to have started affecting, because that's also where the availability of the units fell from above 90% to below 90%, and steadily down to less than 50% last year. Uh, so th I think Mr. Coco certainly had lots of it. And in fact, don't mistake, he's one of the brightest engineers I've met in this part of the world. So uh, I think that uh, he certainly has a point that uh, corruption preceded his tenure as CEO. As I said, I picked it up the first time in 2006 when I went back there. I was gobsmacked by the level of corruption. It seemingly just went unchecked at ESCOM. I was surprised by his statement, which he's making repeatedly in media reports, um, w which, in fact, either is the, the height of um, insanity, where he, and maybe you could comment on this, where he apparently points out to the fact that ESCOM annual reports point to the best technical operational performance in the years between 2015, 2016, and 2017. Um, is this true? Yeah, it's a, it's a bit debatable. Eskom's operational reports from 2005 became more and more opaque as the as performance started declining. So to the extent that uh, it was uh, very well in 2016-2017, uh, when he was around, uh, I think uh, that uh, it's, it's pretty much a, a smoke and mirrors game because what they don't reveal to you is what's included in the counting of the performance and what's excluded. For instance, what's become very clear now is that Eskom, in trying to bolster their numbers of availability, has taken offline uh, units that uh, they can't fix. They don't have the money to fix it or they don't have the acumen to fix it or they don't have the, 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 the latitude or the time to fix it. So what they've just done is they've taken 12 units out of the fleet. So that immediately improves the availability of the rest of the fleet and hides the fact that uh, the total fleet availability has died. So they play those type of games all the time, and it's very difficult as an outsider to know what's included in the pot and what's excluded in the pot through uh, maneuvering and, and suspicious transactions. Uh, you really need to be inside the organization, and that's why I've called since 2010, I've called for two things, the Judicial Commission of Inquiry, which we've now got, the Zomba Commission, but I've also called for a full forensic of ESCOM, because I know of all these partial forensics, but they only tell you the part of the story, they don't tell you the full story. And I think this government is too scared to have a full forensic on ESCOM, because then you'll see too many government leaders' fingers in the pie. So the fear then basically will expose more players? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, it's, when the public becomes aware of what has been going on at ESCOM now, we've all been taken for a ride and they put to a ransom with cries of, of wolf. Uh, the, the, the public confidence in the entity will be shattered. What, why, if, if the evidence, and, and I certainly believe that the evidence is overwhelming, um, the average layman certainly has some kind of inkling, but if the evidence is indeed overwhelming, uh, why then haven't Anoj Singh, Coco, um, Brian Molefe, some of these other individuals, key members within government being criminally charged. Well, what's holding back the NPA, and particularly now during the Ramaphosa administration, which seems to be inherently dragging its feet, with the exception, of course, of the Zondo Commission, there has been no forensic audit, and there's no criminal prosecution to date. 
Because the yeah, Zondo yeah. Commission just simply makes recommendations, but there's no prosecution, no, um, I mean, the consequences of that. Uh, I asked Kulu Pasiwe, he seemed to be on to in total denial uh, some time back that uh, effectively the evidence needs to be brought up, but the evidence is there and there's no prosecution. Okay, so I think more smoke and mirrors by the governing party in that there's no ways that they're going to put their own stock uh, as neck on the chopping block. And I think that is a tragedy of this new government. Uh, the, the period after 1994 is that you've got a, a massive majority by one party and nobody, uh, none of the other parties have been able to hold it to account. I mean, I saw a report in the last 48 hours that even the NPA's uh, uh, prosecution of Mr. Zuma uh, has now been crippled by the fact that the NPA uh, uh, overstepped the time deadlines and mm. uh, didn't, didn't uh, reply with affidavits on, on time. I think it's all part of the is going on at uh, government level where it's, it's too much it's for you and me to expect the ruling party to actually uh, sacrifice its own people. Absolutely, and I, and I agree with you entirely. Dealing with Anoj Singh, I mean, you're probably familiar with the report which stated that during his time in ESCOM, he accumulated something like 19 million rands in one of his FNB accounts, some of which was his monthly remuneration. Um, you know, to date, the source of the funding has obviously remained suspicious. Uh, um, Funduzzi that was mandated by the National Treasury to conduct the investigations um, into the financial irregularity. In fact, the report strangely states that um, analysis of four of Singh's bank accounts, statements of which were contained in his Transnet and ESCOM email uh, accounts and computer hard drives, revealed that he was basically receiving monies which were in fact not accounted for, not used for, um, and at that particular point in time, he was obviously the CFO at Transnet and then subsequently moved to ESCOM. Um, what's your take on that? No, look, I mean, you are talking about a big organization like ESCOM with uh, revenues of 180 billion and an organization that rounds off to the nearest 100 million. Uh, you, you must not be surprised that there's a lot of money that's around. It's been confirmed to me by what new at ESCOM, that uh, they've now discovered a, uh, well, call it official, semi-official, a, a proper uh, identified slush fund to pay off people. And that slush fund is full of, it's, mil it's got millions and millions of rands in it. So uh, don't be surprised by having uh, all these strange amounts floating around uh, under the table. Uh, what, uh, you know, what surprises me is, is that, uh, you know, the, the people actually still they sold for, for a couple of million rand. I would have thought that the, the people that we appoint have a higher level of integrity than what that seems to be the case. Do you have personal information of the fact that as a result of coordinating particularly a lot of these deals with, the, with many of these Gupta-owned supposed mines, that there were paybacks received by these individuals, by Singh, by Molefe, by Koko himself, that they in fact received funds and monies directly from the Guptas. Okay, so I don't have evidence that the Guptas actually paid them off, but I do, I do have, uh, yes, evidence that uh, within Eskom itself, uh, they don't need the outside people to pay them off, they just pay themselves off, that's how brazen they are. So they pay themselves off from the slush fund that is created? No, nobody's been arrested in regard to the slush fund. Uh, some terminations have, have apparently happened. But uh, I think uh, it's early days. I don't want to uh, prejudge myself. Uh, um, I'm hoping to get to the Zonda Commission of Inquiry towards the end of April. And then I'll uh, be able to share some of the information that I've uh, been uh, uh, so, accumulating so, over the last So we would certainly look forward. So you will be testifying at the Zonda Commission in April. And uh, we certainly would look forward to that. But um, we just have to go for a quick ad break. And we'll be back for the third segment shortly. Welcome back to I Beg to Differ, and I'm involved in a fascinating discussion with Ted Blom on what is transpiring in ESCOM. Ted, just before we went to the break, we, we dealt with some of the issues raised, and certainly we would all be looking in anticipation to your testimony at the Zondo Commission. As it stands presently, ESCOM's debt is currently, would I be correct, in the range of 400 billion rands. 
Yeah, 440 if I remember correctly. So it was 4 billion 19 towards the end of last year, and they borrowed another 20 billion. Well, apparently the, the debt is supposed or said to be rising to at least six to 700 billion rands in the next two to three years. Um, most of the debt obviously comes from government bailouts, um, and that obviously means directly from taxpayers' money, and those taxpayers are <laughs> obviously the indirect consumers of that electricity. So it basically, it, 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 it's, uh, it's mind-boggling as to how ESCOM can still expect consumers, um, th that consumers need to fork out between 4 and 19% more for electricity. I mean, it doesn't matter which angle um, or perspective one obviously looks at it, it remains basically totally unfair and, and immoral to the average electricity consumer. No, absolutely. Right up in the first segment that uh, the business market that ESCOM Followed since 2001, it's got a puncture in it, and the puncture gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it falls over. I forecast this current kind of note down more than five years ago in 2013. I said Eskimo will not be around in its current format within five years. So I was maybe two months out, but it was predictable because the way that these guys are overspending, I mean, Madhubi is standing on the Eskimo's books at in excess of 170 billion rand. If you had to go and buy a Madupi off the shelf from the suppliers, it would cost you nothing more than 35 billion rand. So, I mean, if you're sitting with uh, inflated asset values, uh, Kusili is exactly the same. Ingula went from 9 billion to 40 billion. When you start blowing money at the rate of knots and without uh, uh, doing a due diligence on the value that you're getting, this is the disaster that you end up in. And this is partially a, a combination of ineptness, corruption, and maladministration by ESCOM and also the Department of Energy because uh, they are the people who have been put in, and uh, the DPE who have been putting the protagonists in, in charge of ESCOM. So there's no to my mind that the governing party has to carry the can for this. They are fully to blame that uh, it's comrade deployment and, uh, and, and the, we, the public, are being held uh, to ransom by this entity. The 4%, as I understand, um, was approved, correct, and will come into effect in April 2019. Um, ESCOM, in, in fact, has requested a further 15%. Uh, has that been, that, that was of, certainly has to be considered by NERSA. What's the outcome of that? Okay, so the 4% the, uh, is from the RCA from last year, which then kicks in. Uh, ESCOM typically needs uh, about 10 months leadway uh, before they can actually uh, uh, get a, a, a decision from NERSA. Uh, to implement. So the, the 4.41% uh, that's coming in from next month uh, is uh, what was approved at last year's hearing on the RCA, the regular clearing account. And that relates to the overspend uh, that, that took place in 2013 2014. Uh, and uh, so, yes, NERSA has cut back on some of the increases and reclaims that it's allowed ESKIM. The fact of the matter is the current application that ESKIM has put in is technically defective, uh, and I pointed that out to the hearings in Cape Town, the first set of hearings in January this year, and Eskom was given until the 1st of February to remedy this defect in its application. Uh, the, first, uh, the 2nd of February we had hearings in uh, Soweto, and uh, Eskom had still not uh, fixed up those uh, defects, and uh, so as far as I'm concerned, NERSA will be fully entitled to tell ESCOM that its uh, application for price increases to be declined. And on top of that, it, it doesn't really matter because now ESCOM is going to be unbundled. So uh, I don't know which entity is the one that actually applied for the price increases. So besides the fact that the, the increase is defective and should be declined on technical grounds, I think that the new entities that can be uh, brought to, uh, into life by bundling of ESCOM need to do their own cost-cutting and re-budgeting and uh, application for tariff increases if, they, if it's justified. What were the defects in the application? Okay, there were two defects. The funding defect, it, despite all the increases that ESCOM has asked for, when they added all, all of that together over three years, they still sat with a funding deficit of 50 billion rand. Uh, if you compare the in, inflow of cash and the outflow of cash, there was a 50 billion rand hole that they hadn't plugged. But there was Father Christmas or somebody who just given them 50 billion rand uh, to plug that last hole. That's the first thing on the, on the financial side. On the technical side, uh, what they've done certain and they were projecting of 212 or terawatt hours. 
uh, they, they didn't have the plant and the equipment uh, uh, that's capable of generating that amount of electricity. So they're projecting they can't, they actually physically cannot deliver because they don't have the plant in place. Um, so basically, uh, from what I can see, is, is that we, we, we're basically going to look at some form of privatization in the near future. I mean, that's what um, Tito Mberweni kind of hinted in his recent uh, budget address. Yeah, I can't speak to what the, the government's plan is because uh, they haven't been clear in the plan and they haven't taken the public into their confidence to tell them what the end goal is. I think they're playing uh, smokes and mirrors with the, with the unions and that's why they're not telling us. But, but the fact is, under the current scenario, unless there's drastic, uh, drastic uh, uh, intervention somewhere, uh, you and I are going to be facing load shedding for at least the next five years. Um, the, the thing is with privatization, the other danger is that the costs will be extremely high. Higher than what it is presently, even though the present situation is high for electricity consumers. Not necessarily. Um, I've done some costing and, and I would be quite happy to participate as a generator of power if I could get a tariff of around 50 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, you, you're overestimating uh, the, uh, the uh, efficiency of ESCOM. ESCOM is grossly inefficient. Uh, it's on the grid cost is about 35 cents a kilowatt hour. And then by the time you add up its head off its cost and all the wastage and corruption, it comes to over a rand a kilowatt hour. Uh, private generators could generate power right today for less than 50 cents a kilowatt hour onto the grid and still make a good profit. As it stands now, uh, Ted, NERSA in fact sets prices and tariffs for the power utility. Um, and and, and, and where, uh, where does this, I mean, what, what's the kind of margin or uh, uh, is it a kind of an arbitrary process in terms of determining what the prices and the tariffs are? Because I mean, I was, I was surprised by um, uh, Hadebe, the present CEO, who stated that the average price of electricity, 87, 89 cents per kilowatt, is the fifth cheapest in sub-Saharan Africa, and the prices had escalated dramatically in the past eight to ten years. The reality, unfortunately, is that the average household in this country pays something like two to three thousand rands per month for electricity, which is exorbitantly high. Okay, so I think uh, the CES coming has fallen into the trap of the past. And some of these comparisons are a little bit mischievous. Uh, I, I mean, firstly, just as a remark, as an uh, observation, I mean, it's a really sad day that we have to compare our electricity prices with sub-Saharan Africa, when Eskimo in 2001 was the cheapest in the world. So it just tells you that the whole focus is being uh, shifted, uh, to, 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 uh, to shifted to uh, the, the minds of, of the consumers. Um, Eskom might be the cheapest in Sub-Saharan Africa, but Sub-Saharan Africa isn't really a world-class uh, market for electricity. A lot of the markets are inefficient and corrupt and uh, uh, subject to very poor planning. Uh, they will eventually correct themselves. I'm aware of major energy projects in uh, Botswana, Namibia and Zambia as well as Mozambique. And once those projects uh, kick in, uh, because a lot of those com com countries we're dependent on ESCOM, so that's why their prices are higher, because they mark up on what the ESCOM price is. So really to compete uh, yourself with yourself plus a margin is, is not, a, not ingenious. Uh, uh, I, I reject those, the comparison that the, the ESCOM CEOs made. I was, I was speaking of some, a few weeks back with Desmond Dessau. You may not have heard of him, but he's a community activist with the Durban South uh, Community Environmental Alliance who was present at um, the, the recent hearings by NERSA and he stated that the National Energy Regulator of South Africa is inherently in many respects a compromised organization. Would you agree with that? Well, I must that uh, one must remember that NERSA was uh, new formulated in 2000 and it only got its act together to have its first hearings around 2009. Um, I think NERSA, uh, with respect, I think the, the, the new team at NERSA are trying hard, but they don't have the depth of experience to do proper building of ESCOM. They don't seem to understand the dynamics of the ESCOM uh, uh, departments and the behavior. Uh, I ran the modeling of ESCOM in the late 80s, and I'm still running those same models, and they, they seem to be pretty, pretty reliable as to what is going to happen at ESCOM. So I think NERSA listens too much to ESCOM's claims for hardship, 
and, uh, and, 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 uh, and fell into the trap of being uh, sucked in by Eskom's uh, mischievous uh, expenditure and lack of control on, 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 on the corruption expenditure. So I think he's no bit culpable, uh, uh, although maybe in, somewhat in, innocently so. Although there are other people that have uh, uh, tipped me off that uh, even nurses has got its own internal issues. Would you recommend alternatives to the South African public? Things like, for example, solar power, solar energy, um, and so on, as a means to alleviate the current problems and predicaments that South Africans are faced with? Well, I think you just need to be very careful because the lobby is a very noisy lobby. And uh, they've become very noisy from 2010 uh, when the IPP offices were established within the Department of Energy. And even that needs to be uh, scrutinized from scratch because the IPP is mainly were funded by the industry and not by the Department of Energy. And uh, hence the result they put up uh, favor the IPP industry. Uh, one needs to be very careful with that. Secondly, as far as in that South Africa is concerned, you realize that IP power is not dispatchable. It's, uh, it happens whenever the elements of the nature uh, fall in sync and there's sunshine and or wind or whatever it is that they're relying on, but it's not dispatchable. In other words, you can't forecast. If I'm sitting my mining team down at 4 o'clock this morning, I can't forecast that there will be enough IPP power to bring them out at 5 o'clock this afternoon or, or 4 o'clock this afternoon. I also cannot power to keep them ventilated underground while they're there. So whilst the IPP power seems nice and clean and green and all those nice attributes, the fact of the matter is totally unreliable and uh, you cannot run an industrial economy based on IPP power. Ted, I just have to leave it there. We're going for a quick ad break and we'll be back for the final segment and I beg to differ. We'll see you shortly. Welcome back to our Beg to Differ and we're in our final segment discussing the problems and the never-ending concerns that South Africans have over ESCOM. Um, Ted, something I never, I, I, fail, I forgot to ask um, earlier on, which, which Coco did in fact rise, raise in his article, that w obviously the focus of the allegation seemed to be centered around him and his group of cronies. But he attempted to deflect the situation, which you mentioned earlier on, uh, the senior coal scientist Mark van der Ritt, um, who he is alleging was indeed one of the first victims um, of state capture. Um, and, and this is a quotation he gives. He says that under his leadership, generation plant availability broke through the 80% barrier in 1993. He then said targets called 90.7.3, meaning 90% availability, 7% plus percent planned outages, 3% percent planned out unplanned outages. At the time, the actual numbers were 80%, 14%, and 6% respectively. The power station managers then were dumbfounded. This seemed a mission impossible, uh, but Bruce Crooks um, refers to an individual was unreasonable. Every time they complained about the targets, he upped them a little more, and those who would not tag along were forced to leave the organization. Um, what, what's, your, what's your, I mean, I find this certainly new, but certainly as a kind of a deflection to the ongoing problems that we see. Uh, but he, he's, his suggestion now is that the whole issue of state capture was not something that happened during the Gupta uh, reign and the Zuma regime, but something that transpired way back in 93, 92, 91. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh uh, post 1990, when I moved on to the mining company, I wasn't around at Eskom, but I was, but I still had very close dealings with Eskom as a supplier. I was one of the major coal suppliers to Eskom during that period of time, and I was not aware of state capture. The fact of the matter is, Eskom always, in, on the generation side, has always had a very tough culture of fit in or fly away, uh, and and that's what happened. Is is that uh, at the time Bruce Crooks and uh, Mike Deeds and the guys uh, of that era did uh, performance standards on, on the line and you either fitted in or you left the organization. Um, however, uh, I think the state capture and the, 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 the falling off of the wheels of Eskom really only started when there was a latitude in, 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 in the vision of the organization from the lowest cost 
to the biggest profits, and that happened with the Conversion Act of 2001. I think that's when uh, certain people uh, took, uh, to, took uh, the opportunity to start the frauding organization. And as I said, by the time I got there back in 2006, I was gobsmacked by the level of fraud and corruption that had been taking place. And with the, con uh, with the connivance of even the major mining houses, uh, the, the, we had later admitted to uh, corruption and fraud. Uh, but uh, you know, I think part and parcel of, of the whole issue is that uh, South Africa carries a lot of racial baggage. And uh, often people are, are, are too scared to call each other out because of the sensitivities about race. But the fact of the matter is that uh, certainly by 2006, uh, there was a form of capture going on at Eskom because uh, by that time, emergency mandate was in its fifth year and uh, pockets were being lined uh, full of money. That would mean government, uh, government officials, basically. Uh, that, that were, I'm just, I, I just want to know, the, the present state is the, the payment of close to, I think, was it 500 million rands or a billion rands? Uh, to the Tageta Exploration and Resources Limited, that's the company that was controlled by the Gupta family. What's the status of those payments? Because payments have gone out, uh, and payments up till recently were still being made um, as late as 2018. What's the status now? Okay, as I alluded to you in the second segment, uh, I've uh, made a dossier available to the SIU, uh, the first dossier of three, uh, and that was to liquidate the uh, to get a Brockfontein uh, uh, coal contract, and the Eskom was still paying money for very poor quality rock, not coal. Uh, my second exercise would be to compile a second dossier uh, regarding the optimum transaction, which then covers the 700 odd billion rand, sorry, million rand uh, that was uh, prepaid to uh, to uh, Oak Bay, and then my third dossier. I uh, live long enough to get there, will be the honor dossier, and that is where um, Eskom, with the uh, connivance of uh, Oak Bay and Tegeta, uh, kicked out Xara as a supply of coal to Arnott Power Station and supplemented the, uh, the uh, Tegeta mines to uh, uh, supply the, the coal to, to, to the Arnott Power Station. So that's the third that to be dissolved. And then hopefully if those three dossiers are acted upon uh, as the SIU has done with the first dossier, then uh, we'll be rid of the Gupta era's influence on Eskom. And then all that needs to uh, remain is that Eskom needs to put in enriching claims against Tegeta, even though Tegeta is bankrupt, uh, to try and claim back some of the overpaid money. Oh, but that, that's but, the whole point. How much money has gone? How much money? You're looking at close to a billion? I, I reckon that... Um, uh, it's, it's very difficult to quantify at this stage of the game, but I, I would guess that uh, the, t the Brockfontein contract was for 3.7 billion initially, uh, and then it was extended and increased, uh, and one will just have to keep track of what money has flown. But I would say uh, that I, I would anticipate more than a, far more than a billion rand. So a as it stands now, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not too clear, have the payments stopped or are they still ongoing? The payment, I know the dossiers you were speaking of, but have the payments stopped? Um, as far as I, the payments were taking place to, uh, during last year, what has happened this year, still early in the new, in, you know, in 2019, uh, I haven't had a chance to uh, to check up at Eskom if those payments are still continuing or not. But certainly, they took some which took place last year under the directorship of the new management at Eskom, and that's what really shocks me. Because I, I read a news report, and just this is a few weeks ago that. There was plans to take the, this matter of court the, because effectively what, what the public need to know is that ESCOM is paying millions and billions for either poor quality coal or coal that they're not receiving when there's existing coal that they're not accessing, which is, which is the height of insanity. Okay, so I think you point in and the public is probably blissfully unaware of it is that uh, there's a lot of corruption taking place on the coal account and be because it's one of the bigger accounts within Eskom, it's, uh, that's why it's more likely to attract more crooks. Uh, but Eskom is, has been paying for coal not delivered uh, since 2006. Eskom has been overpaying for coal specifications uh, also since 2006 that I can pick up. And I'm, I'm led to believe that it happened before that, from 2001 when Eskom started buying in coal from all these other third-party players, uh, which was not subject to Weybridge uh, control, nor to laboratory control to check the specifications of the coal. So in, the, in actual fact, Eskom has paid for non-delivery of coal, 
In 2007, they had to write off 400,000 tons of coal at Creel, uh, which they couldn't find. Uh, according to the paperwork, the coal had been delivered, but when they did a survey of the stockpile, they couldn't find that level of coal. Now, 400,000 tons of coal is about seven football fields full of coal. That's a lot of coal to be missing at one power station. Hmm. But that just gives you the extent of the corruption at Eskom, is that uh, 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 you're talking about a multi-site environment. So that's very really easy to penetrate because you've got different uh, 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 breakdowns in control at different sides of ESCO. But uh, the corruption doesn't only extend to the coal account. The corruption extends to the feeding account, the security account, the procurement. I mean, I saw about three weeks ago, somebody alerted me to the fact that ESCO buys high-pressure valves. Now, that makes sense if you in the power station business. The high-pressure valves leave the factory at 60,000 rand a valve. By the time it gets to Eskom, after all the middlemen have taken a cut, that, that same one high pressure valve is in Eskom's books at over 2 million rand. I'm, I'm, I'm gobsmacked, gobsmacked. And the reality, Ted, is that that money will never be recovered. I mean, most of these companies, you speak about uh, Tagata Exploration, most of these Gupta owned companies are inherently bankrupt. The monies that are lost, I mean, the, the corruption permeates such a level that regardless of how many criminal prosecutions will ensue in the next few years, that money is gone, that money is lost, and eventually the South African public will have to pay for that. Uh, I'm sad to admit, uh, I think you've got a point and you're probably right, that uh, together with the slackness of our prosecuting authorities and the fact that they were also themselves captured to various levels of, uh, levels of uh, corruption, uh, I think you've, uh, I mean, uh, you know, one always hope, wants to hope for the better, but the fact of the matter is that you're probably correct that most of this money will never ever be recovered because of slack uh, policing, slack uh, prosecuting, and also corruption in those entities that are supposed to take uh, action against the, the so-called crooks. The other matter is that, you know, uh, Eskom bloats, uh, bloats about uh, the fact that it's, uh, you know, busy prosecuting five or ten people. The fact of the matter is there's more than a thousand corrupted system, if not over 5,000 corruptors. Uh, plus that's the post workers. There's post workers on Eskom's payroll uh, for more than 10 years. And, and, and then even though the, the current management admits that they are ghost workers, they themselves have done nothing to eradicate the organization of ghost workers. So I'm really very disappointed at the level of interaction and control that the new board has taken over Eskom. It seems to me it's still a free for all. It seems to be a free for all. And, and what is quite strange, if you're running a company, Ted, um, and your company underperforms, you're obviously going to reduce your staff intake. But it seems to be the opposite. Not only has the staff intake increased at ESCOM, but you see that there's been salary hikes. I mean, uh, the, the salary of uh, Pakabisani Hadebe and Brian Molefe is not much significantly different in access. I think I was reading something like 2.4, 2.5 million per annum, uh, plus the additional perks. I mean, it seems to be individuals that are placed in these particular positions just simply to uh, line their pockets and, 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 and effectively run riot with state resources at their own personal and private expenses. Uh, in fact, those salary levels are much higher than what you've indicated. Uh, the CEO of Eskom currently gets paid in excess of 8 million rand a year. The, the C the, sorry, the CEO of Eskom presently gets paid 8 million rands a year. And then and add to that the fact that he's got zero energy experience and he's got zero ESCOM experience. He's the same with Brian Molefe. I mean, this, this is Brian Molefe uh, earned the same amount. And uh, Hadebe seems to be continuing along the same particular trajectory. And that's the whole point. I mean, this also kind of uh, 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 lays the basis for the fact that the, there seems to be a level of inertia in the Ramaphosa administration to do anything. Uh, they're basically ex extremely slow in terms of the steps and, and, and the trajectory that they want to embark on, particularly when the s same situation seems to be continuing, the same trajectory, same salary hikes, same increase. I mean, the average employee, I'm told, at ESCOM earns something like 400,000 rands per annum, uh, regardless, of course, of the... the, the and, and you're telling me 8 million rand for the CEO. That's an absolute travesty uh, of injustice, being paid by the taxpayer. I need to correct you. The average salary of the Eskom employee is over 800,000, not 400,000 per annum. Well, that's, uh, that, I, I was not aware of it. I thought that the amount was 400,000. That, that, that's more, I mean, the, um, uh, I'm, in, I'm in the legal profession, and I can tell you something, Ted. Uh, within the judiciary, 
um, a, a magistrate, a senior district court magistrate, earns six to seven hundred thousand rands per annum. So an employee with an ESCOM, and many of these individuals have absolutely no qualification, lack of experience, earn more than many judicial officers, which is an absolute shame and disgrace. No, and on top of it, I've discussed a lot of the ESCOM employees that earn the salaries, actually have fake qualifications. ESCOM has taken it upon itself. Uh, prior to prior to when I just worked at ESCOM, uh, you, when you apply, uh, apply, your qualifications were sent and checked by a private investigator and signed off. ESCOM now said that uh, doesn't want to invade on people's privacy, so it no longer checks on people's qualifications. So a lot of the people got fake qualifications, and uh, and uh, as I said, they're still ghost workers as well, and the salary is in, in excess of 800,000 uh, rands a year. In fact, that number might have cut down a little bit because they've employed some people below that number, but uh, it's still way in excess of what anybody else gets paid in, in, in the economy. So it's both Brian Molefe, Paka Musani Hadebe, Machele Koko. None of these individuals had qualifications. I know Singh was an accountant uh, working at Transnet, but none of them had the expertise, experience, or the qualifications needed to run this particular inst entity, uh, resulting obviously in its collapse over and above many other factors. Um, if I may, I think Mr. Koko is a qualified engineer and he's a very clever man, as I said previously. And he did have 25 years experience at ESCOM. Um, but uh, as for Mr. Singh and Mr. Malefa, no, they came from Transnet. They had no energy experience. Lastly, would you like to see these individuals prosecuted? Look, I, I think it's, you know, it's a bit like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, where uh, the perpetrators of apartheid were taken to book. I think we need something similar to take the perpetrators of state capture to book. Uh, you know, uh, I know that uh, in certain uh, mindsets, uh, one shouldn't be seeking retribution and leave that to the gods. But uh, the fact of the matter is, if there is no punishment of these people, and they are walk away scot free, it just leaves the field open to the next uh, batch of people to come in and be corrupt and, and, to, and to capture the state. And I think it's part and parcel of the problem at Eskom is that um, the board has not been able to control Eskom. You've then seen the minister uh, try and take control of Eskom. He seems to be having problems controlling Eskom. They've now appointed a whole clutch of experts and external wise men and auditors and knows who all to try and get control of ESCOM. But ESCOM is not allowing anybody to control it. So even the president is now taken to interfering by breaking up ESCOM. I think it's just symptomatic of how difficult the problem is. ESCOM has become rogue and it's become a, a force unto itself. And, and that's part and parcel of the problem, is that uh, it's so strong that uh, even the president seems to be having, be having problems uh, sorting it out and breaking it up to try and get control of the different parts. And that's why they, they're able to hold the South African population to ransom. Well, Mr. Blom, I want to thank you for your time. Certainly, um, you have painted a bleak picture uh, of what South Africans are certainly facing. Um, and we certainly will chat in the near future. I want to thank you for your time and uh, your patience in conveying some of this shocking and startling information to us. And that's all we have for this evening, folks. Um, I'm your host, Yusuf Ismail. You have been watching I Beg to Differ. And we have been discussing the ongoing shenanigans and problems at ESCOM. And join us next week for more hard-hitting debate. Till next time, this is Yusuf Ismail. Greetings of peace and good evening.